At the dawn of the 9th century, the Viking Age had begun. Coastal towns and monasteries across Western Europe fell victim to brutal raids, their treasures plundered and people carried off as slaves. This age of war and trade would last for the next 300 years, and a key to Nordic success was the Viking longship. The speed, maneuverability and shallow draft of these predatory vessels allowed the Vikings to navigate coastal waters and run their ships onto isolated beaches from which to launch surprise attacks on nearby settlements. Before any local force could organize and retaliate, the Vikings were long gone. These ships carried mighty invasions that carved out new kingdoms across the British Isles. They plundered as far as France and Italy. However, the longships were used for other purposes. Viking traders were able to navigate the rivers and lakes of Russia, reaching as far as Byzantium. The longships carried settlers that colonized the North Sea Islands, even a temporary colony in North America. However, these waves of expansion and trade were nothing new. Scandinavia had traded with the Mediterranean since the Bronze Age. Warlike peoples such as the Cimbrians, Goths and Saxons all ventured out of Scandinavia to establish new realms across Europe. The Viking Age didn't come out of nowhere, not did their ships. Thus, to understand the Viking longship, we'll have to start from the beginning. I'll preface by saying that I've already made a video covering the ancient shipbuilding of Scandinavia. So if you want to learn more about that topic, go and check it out, or check it out after this video. What comes next is a summary of the major innovations. Scandinavia's rough terrain has always facilitated the need for alternate travel. One was to use the ice and snow, but this was only possible during winter. Otherwise, it was best to travel via the many waterways, fjords, lakes, coasts and rivers. For this purpose, the ancient Nordics built canoes from sealskin and hollowed out logs. These early craft established a shipbuilding tradition of strong, light and flexible vessels. They created a maritime culture where travel by sea was a vital way of life, evidenced by the many cave paintings and rock carvings. Of course, these early vessels were rudimentary. Before the longship was even possible, several major innovations had to be unlocked through hundreds, thousands of years of trial and error. Neither did these people have writing. Knowledge was passed on by word of mouth from the boat builder to his son. Things were forgotten, and the wheel was likely reinvented several times, so to speak. The first major innovation was building the ship's hull from planks. Neither dugouts nor skin boats were seaworthy enough. The real deal was cutting the logs into planks and placing them onto a framework called the ribs. Ribs were first used in the skin boats. This hull construction would finally peak in the 4th century AD, when Scandinavians invented the clinker hull. Clinker means to fasten together. This method has the edges of the hull planks overlap each other, almost forming a sort of stairwell. Whilst the hulls built before the clinker were soon together with rope and sinew and stuff, clinker hulls were built with iron nails secured in small square holes. This construction method would persist through the Viking Age to this day. The next major innovation was rowing. The ribs were secured horizontally with benches called thwarts. At each end was an oar lock that secured the oar. Compared to paddling, which was the only mode of propulsion for the previous boats, rowing was faster and less exhaustive. Related to propulsion was the method of steering. The early boats were steered with a simple steering oar or paddle, which isn't easy by any means. Around the 5th century, Scandinavian boats were fitted with a triangular rudder, making steering much easier. This started the tradition of always placing the rudder on the right side of the stern, giving that direction the name steering board, or starboard in modern English. The invention which really made the longship that we know was the keel. Before the keel, the nexus of the boat was just a bottom plank. The keel, being a thin part of wood running vertically along the boat, is vital for balance and strength. Without a keel, boats were liable to capsizing, hogging or swamping, making travel by sea very difficult. Interestingly enough, the word keel derives from the Old Norse word for ship, kjold. This just proves how important the keel was, when it was the very name of the ship itself. The stability added by the keel allowed the ship to finally add a sail to their ships, giving them incredible speed. However, we'll discuss the sail in the next section, about the construction of the longship itself. But before the ship could be built, materials had to be gathered. The task itself of constructing a ship had become much harder. Whilst making a dugout could be managed by one or two guys, 
a longship required a whole team to be built. At the top was the master shipwright. Under him was a team of artisans, skilled in one task or another. The shipwright did not rely on any plans to build a ship, but worked with iteration passed down from the generations before him. His experienced eye and the rule of thumb dictated the vessel's final shape and size. Of course, the vessels varied depending on its purpose and the region in which it was built. One of the most important of these tasks was going into the forest and identifying what trees were the best for what in the ship's structure. Tall forest oak was the best for the keel and planking, while masts, yards, spars and oars were best cut from pine. Isolated field oaks with low curving bows were best for the ribs, stem and stern pieces, and the rudder was best formed from the trunk. Carpenters took advantage of the tree's natural shape. Naturally angled pieces could be worked into knees and rowlocks. The natural joints where a branch grew out of a trunk, for example, was great for fashioning a keelson with a supporting arm. Timber was best gathered during winter. The lack of undergrowth made it easier to identify the trees and able to transport them with sleighs over the snow. Freshly cut timber is also more stable in the cold, when it is less likely to dry out and crack. Planks were made by splitting the logs with axes, chisels and wedges. Saws weren't used, since they compromised the strength of the timber. If the planks were used while still fresh and green, they could easily be curved and twisted when forming the hull. Evidence even points to timber being stored in bogs to keep them moist. Every part of the tree was used. Spare wood was used for things like rigging blocks and trenails. Trenails are nails made from wood. Bast fibers, found just below the bark, were twisted into rope. Sawdust and shipping were used as firewood and to smoke meat, fish and cheese. <laughs> Dude, I love cheese. Whilst the early boats were constructed with a shell-first method, meaning that the hull was built first, the Viking longship began with its most integral section, the keel. The shipwright supervised this bit closely, since a faulty keel would spell disaster for the rest of the structure. After the keel was laid, the stem and stern pieces were attached. Next the shell was formed. The hull was built by overlapping the planks and securing them with iron nails. When the hull was done, the ribs were added, followed by the keelson and crossbeams. The keelson wasn't attached to the keel but rested on it. Whilst it was used to support the keel, its primary purpose was to support a mast, which I'll get into later. Seams in the hull were caulk using ropes of animal hair, coated with pine tar. This was to prevent leaks. Since the gunnels of the longship were higher than previous craft, it was impractical to secure the oars to oar locks. Rather, the oars were secured through oar holes pierced in the sides. Each of these holes had a narrow slot facing the back of the ship, through which the blade of the oar could pass when the oars had to be pulled in. If the ship was intended for heavy seas, the holes would be shuttered to prevent water from entering. Most longships weren't built with rowing benches, rather the rowers sat down on the crossbeams or on their sea chests. Merchant ships carried only two to four oars, whilst warships carried as many as sixty. Viking longships are often noted by their shield racks. These were placed on a batten running along the gunnel. It had a multitude of gaps where the shields could be slotted, and arranged in such a way that they did not cover the oar holes, meaning that the ships could be rowed with the shields in place. Finally, the mast was attached to the keelson. The keelson's primary purpose was to distribute the weight of the mast and the strain exerted by it when operating under sail. The mast was steadied by additional arms and knees, and by two yards running to the stem and stern respectively. After the mast was attached, the longship was fitted with a deck. The back of the longship might be built with a quarter deck, slightly raised over the main deck, giving a higher position for the commander and steerman. Then the ship could be furnished with a gangplank, bales, water barrels and an iron anchor, likely one of the major expenses. Ballast stones were placed at the bottom of the ship, for the sake of stability. Sails and rigging were made by craftsmen and women that worked close to the shipyard. The sails were woven from coarse wool that was wax and oil as proofing against the elements. To stop the sails from sagging and losing their shape, they were reinforced internally by diagonal lattice work of rope. Such an arrangement may have been depicted in these picture stones from 9th century Gotland, creating a distinctive diamond pattern in the Viking sails. The sagas describe Viking sails as being striped or checkered with colors like blue, red, green and white. The remnants of the sail in the Gukstar ship were white striped with red. Ropes were fashioned from horse tails, bast, hemp and the skin of the walrus, whale and seal. Standing rigging seems to have been simple and minimal. Masts were supported by two or three shrouds. 
Rigging most likely included a halyard for lowering the yard and the sail. It is apparent that the Vikings took great pride in their ships. They gave them names such as Great Serpent, Fjord Elk, Orsted and Surf Dragon. This is apparent in the decorations depicted in some of the art and archaeological findings. The Osebergs ship was decorated by lavish carvings in the prow and stern, the finest discovered from the Viking Age. However, due to its other, less seaworthy qualities, the Osebergs ship is believed to have been a pleasure craft for royalty. One cannot discuss the longship and its decoration without their figureheads. They are often called dragon ships from the serpentine shape of dragons in their prows. This graffiti dating from the 13th century shows a variety of figureheads, including two dragons or other beasts, and a multitude of weather vanes carried at the prow. According to the sagas, Vikings removed their figureheads whenever they landed on a friendly shore. That was because they didn't wish to scare the local spirits away. This tradition seems to have persisted into Christian times. On the Bayou tapestry, we see the Norman fleet departing home with their figureheads. When they land in England, the figureheads have been taken down. The result was a vessel that could reach a length of 30 meters and a width of 5. A typical longship achieved a speed of 6 to 8 knots, but modern replicas have reached 14, and one of the largest is believed to have been able to reach 20. But of course, speed and crew and size varied by the types, which we'll get into next. The earliest longships built in the 9th century were called Kard or Karvi. Being small and wide, they were all-purpose rather than specialized. They were used both for war and trade, and it would take two centuries of shipbuilding tradition to produce specialized vessels. Certain Karvi were used for very distinct purposes, however. The Åseberg ship was unearthed inside a burial mound in Norway, and is believed to have been a pleasure craft built for a queen. The skeleton of two older women were discovered in the grave. The ship itself is the most lavish Viking vessel ever uncovered. The prow and stern stand 5 meters tall and are decorated with carvings of beasts. Where the arc spirals, the lines imitate the body of a serpent, ending in the dragon's head at the fore and its tail at the back. Her construction indicates that she wasn't to be used for traveling outside of coasts or inland waters. For example, the oar holes lack any shutters, meaning that the sea could get inside. The Gukstad ship was likewise discovered inside a burial mound. The skeleton in the grave belonged to a strongly built man that died in his 60s. In his grave were likewise 12 horses, 6 dogs, and even a peacock. Since peacocks are only native to India, this hints at far-flung trade connections and adventures. Unlike the Oseberg, the Gokstar ship was built for ocean travel. She is built with 6 strakes or planks above the waterline, and the oar holes are secured with round shutters. The ship was found with 64 shields, which were painted alternatively black and yellow. However, the shields weren't slotted to the shield rack, but tied to it with cords. The deck planks weren't secured with nails, meaning that they could be removed for easy access to the cargo, food or weapons, and for bailing out water in case of leakage. This further indicates that the Goksat was actually built as a chieftain's flagship. But since she was a Karvi, and all-purpose, we don't know if he used her for trade, piracy, or both. By the dawn of the 11th century, Viking shipbuilders had begun constructing specialized craft. These include the longships used for war, and the cargo ships called Knarr. All of them share the same basic construction, though some improvements have been made from the Karvi. An interesting note is that more wood types than oak were used in their construction, possibly because suitable oaks were becoming scarce from the excessive shipbuilding. One Norwegian king in the 11th century was said to have 1,200 ships. Scandinavian monarchs instituted the Leadung, a system in which every territory serving the king had to provide ships and the men to crew them during times of war. The purpose of these ships was to transport as many fighting men as possible to the war zone, without having to rely on the wind for power. This gave rise to the various longships, or langskips as they were called. Whilst the Karvi had a short and almost round shape, being very wide amidships, the longships were long and narrow, with a length to breadth ratio of 7 to 1. The smallest of the longships was a snekja, meaning snake. They were typically 17 meters long, 2.5 meters wide, and had 20 rowing benches for a crew of 40. They were so light that they didn't need a port, and could just be beached. If they needed to cross a landmass they could be carried, or rolled over land on greased logs. This was how the Vikings moved between the rivers of Russia. At sea they were incredibly fast. A modern replica called the Helge Ask was able to reach a speed of 14 knots under sail, Against the wind and powered by oars, she reached a speed of 
Of medium size was the scathe, meaning slider, referring to a knife sheath. They contained 30 rowing benches, and were as long as 30 meters. They could carry 16 to 80 warriors, and travel at speeds of up to 20 knots. Whilst most were used for war and transport, some were employed as fire ships. When Harald Hårråde attacked Hedeby in 1050, he set the town ablaze by sending several burning ships into the harbor, destroying it. The largest of the Skei were the royal flagships. They were known as Drakkar or Drekki, being lavishly decorated with dragon figureheads. Whilst mostly mentioned in the sagas, it is possible that one of the ships excavated at Roskilde was a Drakkar. It is the largest ship discovered from the Viking Age. It was 36 meters long and 3.5 meters wide, and could easily have carried a hundred warriors. Truly, a ship fit for a king. Another ship said to be under car was the Mora, given to William the Conqueror by his wife. She was the largest and fastest ship of his fleet, and we see her depicted in the Bayou Tapestry. This tapestry gives us a lot of insight into the 11th century Viking shipbuilding, and how the longships looked. The Norman fleet had striped, coloured sails, and the Mora herself had a dragon figurehead, and the banner of the Pope at her masthead. While Scandinavian ships carried round shields along the gunnels, the Normans carried their kite shields there instead. But William the Conqueror wasn't a Viking by any means. Whilst he was the descendant of Vikings, he and his ancestors were the feudal vassals of the King of France. They were Christian and spoke French. Indeed, most of the unique Viking ship types were invented after the Vikings were Christianized. Though many were still used for pirating, they were now also used for dynastical conflicts, defending against pirates, and even crusading. The merchant ship called Knarr was developed to meet the growing needs of Viking colonists. Having settled the rugged islands of the North Sea, they now needed supplies from the homeland if they were able to survive. These ships not only had to carry a large amount of goods to the colonies, but survived those hardy seas. The Knarr was the most seaworthy vessel ever produced by the Vikings. Having a broad beam and high sides, they were almost entirely reliant on their sail as the mode of propulsion. The typical Knarr was 16.3 meters in length, and had a width amidships of 4.5 meters. The height from the keel to gunnel was 2.1 meters. The cargo hold had a size of 30 to 35 cubic meters that could carry approximately 24 tons. This cargo would have included provisions, timber, metal, families of settlers, and even live animals. She would have required between 5 to 8 men to handle her sail, and utilize 2 or 4 oars for maneuvering. Since the Knarr was too heavy to be beached, it could not travel by land, and relied on a small ship's boat to ferry goods to and from the shore. This boat would have been carried aboard, or towed astern. Modern replicas show that the Knarr could have achieved a speed of 12 to 13 knots in optimal weather. Traveling from Norway to Iceland would have taken between 5 to 20 days. However, due to the improper navigational methods, many Knarrs set off from home and were never seen again. Viking navigation is something I'll have to tackle in a separate video, however. The Viking longship was the culmination of hundreds, thousands of years of shipbuilding culture and innovation. But it wasn't only the longship which allowed them to undertake their expeditions of plunder and trade, but the decentralization and weakness of the European kingdoms. As the centuries progressed, these dominions grew stronger, improved their defenses and stabilized. England united into one realm. Castles were built to protect against piratical raids. Stability led to economic expansion. Now the continentals were looking to trade and they developed their own ship, the Cog. Compared to the Knarr, it had a much larger cargo hold. This allowed the German Hansa to dominate the Baltic Sea and cause all manners of cringe for the next few hundred years. That was until the Scandis got their shit straight again and started beating the Germans up. But uh, anyway, uh, the longships were abandoned in favor of larger warships with high sides and raised castles that could easily defend against borders. The Age of Vikings and their ships was over. If you enjoy the content I produce, consider supporting me monetarily on Patreon. You'll find the link in the video description. Otherwise, please give the video a like and a comment, so that YouTube will show it to more potential viewers. And why not share it with a friend? Cheers.